Hello, my friend. This is Clyde. Time to settle the difference. Part two. Last time we met, we started a conversation on the issue of the Holy Spirit and set out to understand the differences of opinion about the work of the Holy Spirit. This is an ongoing issue within the church, and we are trying to find a way to come to a single understanding of the Holy Spirit and what he does in the church of Jesus Christ. Let us establish one thing. This global institution that we call the church was born historically on the day of Pentecost in the year that Jesus died, rose from the dead, and returned to heaven. A congregation of 120 faithful followers of Jesus, including 11 of the original disciples who were with Jesus in the challenging years of his earthly ministry, they were there. In a move that, could, that they could never imagine, the Holy Spirit arrived clear to air and eye alike. They heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind. They saw tongues of fire resting on the head of each person in the upper room. And the most astounding feature of that grand arrival was when he, the Holy Spirit, gave the divine release for each of those 120 people to start speaking in tongues in various foreign languages that were later identified as belonging to the Jewish diaspora, people who came from out of town and outside from other nations. Certainly, these unlearned Galilean men and women did not learn these various languages in college, and so the people began to state that they were drunk. That is quite an excuse for them to be suddenly speaking a foreign language or foreign languages. But Peter refuted that false notion and took the opportunity to go on to preach the first Pentecost-inspired sermon that day. And in the end, 3,000 were added to them, that is, to the original 120. This was the birth of the church, but the name was not used until Luke, who wrote this Acts of the Apostles account, wrote that after a few days and a growing interest in what these 120 people had started up in Jerusalem, things were multiplying. Catch this. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 2 and verse 47. All of that was due to the work of the Holy Spirit. He was the driving force to the birth of the greatest human institution in the history of all mankind. When we look at the early church and what they ex experienced in the carefully documented work of Acts of the Apostles, we see a church that experienced challenges including disturbances among the various groups over distribution of some material things. There was a challenge of coming to grips with the question of whether the early church was exclusively for Jewish people, or was it that God intended to, be, to create a united church, including Jews and Gentiles? These were some of the top issues that sought to divide the church, and there were splits. But as we read in the writings of the Old Testament books, what we saw was a unified unfolding of the works of the Spirit that suggested that what happened in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, and Acts 19 were all part of the same experience. The description of this experience might be similar, although some slightly different language were used. In Acts 2, we read that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, it says that when Peter and John placed hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. In Acts 10, we read that the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. And in Acts 19, it says, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. 
all four accounts seem to be in the same vein as the language Jesus used to describe this charismatic experience when he says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And this experience resulted in the persons receiving divine supernatural power to be the witnesses that Jesus ordained them to be starting in Matthew 28 verses 18, 19, 20, the occasion of the Great Commission. For the rest of the New Testament, we read about such things as the gifts of the Spirit, including speaking in tongues and prophecy and healing and interpretation of tongues. Then in Ephesians 5, we read the instructions to the church folk to not be drunken with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. We read that we should walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, Galatians 5 and verse 16. We read of the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We read later in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7 that God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love and self-discipline. And finally, in Revelation, we read what John described in that amazing experience where he said, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. Nowhere in the, in the New Testament do we see any contention or controversy about the power and work of the Holy Spirit in the life of early church believers that could lead to a split. Now we jump over to the turn of the 20th century and we see the emergence, the organic emergence of what we now know as the Pentecostal movement, a supernatural occurrence of what happened in the early church. And that has become one of the most contentious and divisive issue in the church of Jesus Christ. There are those who believe in the biblical Pentecostal manifestation of the Holy Spirit closely resembling what happened in the early church. The other half of the divide argues that the Holy Spirit no longer works like it, what it, he did in the old days and what has emerged is a movement minus the charisma that is popular on the Pentecostal side. The question is, which side is true and which side has missed the mark? We could just settle the question right here and now and declare the winner. That would lead to continued controversy because each side is confident in their conviction that their theology, their understanding of Holy Spirit and his work is correct. So if we are going to conclude, let us settle the difference with the use of scripture if we will agree that all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. That said, we will not discard or dismiss one piece of scripture to suit our human preferences. We are subject to the counsel of scripture, period. I ask that we Ask the Holy Spirit to bring us into his meaning of scriptures and do not relegate the counsel of the Holy Spirit to a lower level by replacing it with what your denomination, your pastor, your favorite televangelist or small group leader says. What the scripture says is the book for all of us Christians. So Paul writes, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That settles it.